Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro welcomed the beautification of Jose Gregorio Hernandez, known as the Doctor of the Poor, by Pope Francis this Friday. The U.S. city of New York saw a march to commemorate Juneteenth this Friday. Palestinians living in the Jordan Valley are afraid of losing their land and being unable to access their crops if Israel continues with its illegal annexation plans. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south and I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Venezuela where President Nicolas Maduro welcomed the beautification of Jose Gregorio Hernandez, known as the Doctor of the Poor, by Pope Francis this Friday. President Maduro noted on Twitter that church bells rang across Venezuela to mark the occasion. Dr. Jose Gregorio Hernandez previously held the title of Venerable, declared by Pope John Paul II in 1986. Dr. Hernandez was born in the Venezuelan state of Trujillo in 1864 and was a founding member of the National Academy of Medicine. He passed away in Caracas in June 1919. The move means the popular figure to whom many Venezuelans turn in times of prayer is now one step closer to be being declared a saint. Guyanese opposition leader Barat Jagdeo has stated that the notice of motion filed in the Court of Appeal by a supporter of the caretaker APNU AFC coalition is a disguised elections petition. The Court of Appeal was expected to hear the application on Friday. It is asking for a series of orders to stop the Guyana Elections Commission from moving ahead with the declaration of the final results of the March 2nd general elections. However, Jack Deo, who is also the General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party Civic, the alliance that has emerged as the winner of the vote, contends that the court has no jurisdiction to hear the matter. Chief Elections Officer Keith Lowenfield was expected to submit his final elections report to the Commission on Thursday, but delayed doing so after he was served with the legal notice. There are 2,339 polling places. <laughs> Education officials in St. Lucia are planning for a safe reopening of schools in September 2020 for all students, but noted that it all depends on the advice of the Ministry of Health and the Chief Medical Officer. The Ministry of Education, on the advice of the Ministry of Health and Wellness, decided to commence a phased reopening of schools for Grade 6 and Form 5 as of June 3rd. The decision was taken to facilitate the preparation of students for the Common Entrance and CSEC examinations. A multifaceted approach to teaching has been implemented, including virtual classes to keep students engaged during the period away from the classroom as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Every principal is charged with the effective and efficient management of the plant. We will make and we have made recommendations, but in terms of policing, I'm really hoping that our parents see themselves as partners in this because the child would have had to leave, left home with a mask on, that our parents and adults can appreciate that the child is wearing his or her school uniform and so should be dressed appropriately. But similarly, our principals are charged and the school rules remain the same. The school rules have not changed. We're coming back for a period of less than 16 days to ensure that we bridge that gap. But our students likewise, our secondary and our grade six students, and I always like to appreciate that they're smart children. With, with 10, 11, and 12, our children know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. In terms of policing and reminding, obviously that will be done, but we really appreciate the sense of responsibility that every individual parent, teacher, student must take for his or her own welfare. And in particular reference to the use of masks, that they know that they're coming to a school environment, a professional environment, and so they dress accordingly. As Peru battles with the ongoing pandemic three months into lockdown, Lima residents are organizing to help feed their neighbors. Soup kitchens and community pots have become a symbol of the difficult situation faced by a large part of the working population who do not form part of the formal economy. Without unemployment benefits or enough food, many Peruvians continue to leave their homes each day to earn a living as construction workers, street vendors or other types of day labourers. Despite some of the strictest lockdown measures in the region, Peru has reported over 247,000 confirmed coronavirus cases and more than 7,600 fatalities. There are people and families in worse conditions than me. 
There are families with four, ten children. They're having a worse time. It's painful. And now without a job. It's very difficult and sad because I have children. And when they ask for food and there is none, I can take it. But they as kids can't. In Brazil, the number of COVID-19 cases could reach 1 million and the death toll is expected to exceed 50,000 this weekend. Experts point out that if drastic measures are not implemented by the federal government, the country will hit two negative milestones of the pandemic. Looking at data from the last three days, they predicted that the number of COVID-19 cases will increase exponentially. Brazil's health ministry acknowledged that over the last three weeks, more cases were confirmed than expected. Despite this, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, two of the most affected cities, are promoting economic reopening measures. In Bolivia, the de facto government is trying to ban the movement towards socialism, which enjoys the broadest popular support, from being able to run in the upcoming elections. Meanwhile, social movements have protested, demanding that the elections be held as scheduled on September 6, despite the regime's attempts to delay the vote. And said that the de facto coup government doesn't want to hold elections on September 6, as was agreed upon by political parties and the electoral court. Despite that, Janine Añez continues to campaign. Evo and his coca growers have tried to return to power. On the other hand, there is a path of the government which the majority of Bolivians want, the path of unity, of bonuses, the path of reactivating old economy. The de facto government ministers are also issuing threats with the support of police and the military to the movement towards socialism and all while repeating the electoral campaign lines of Fañas. The majority of Bolivians don't want to have a Bolivia where some Bolivians confront others. They want a Bolivia where some help the others. The path of the president is the path of democracy and unity of all Bolivians. Is the path where Bolivians help one another. The Legislative Assembly approved the law presented by the Electoral Court to hold elections on September 6th. But Janine Añez says she will be required a scientist report on the evolution of the pandemic and then said that she would like the elections to be postponed for possibly two additional months. Beginning now, workers are standing up to fight. If they don't enact the law of elections, workers will be in the streets and on the highways. Social organizations have practically given ultimatum to some of verification of the suspended election will be guaranteed. They should have been held on May 3rd and were held off because of the coronavirus. To Mrs. Añez, there are two options. One is to immediately approve the date of elections for September 6th. The second option is the uprising of the people. And know that you either go with national democratic elections or you choose the social uprising because the people have had enough. The de facto government has tried out to outlaw the movement towards socialism, a party running first in the polls, whose members are accused of terrorism. Janine Añez, who herself is a candidate, is working to maintain the third place standing, all while the seven candidates of the right go after the second places, standing to try to have a chance in the event of a second round. Freddy Morales, Telesur, Bolivia. We have more stories coming up after this very short break, so don't go away. The U.S. city of New York saw a march to commemorate Juneteenth this Friday. Hundreds of protesters participated in the silent march from the New York neighborhood of Harlem to Seneca Village in Central Park to mark Juneteenth, a date that celebrates the liberation of those who had been held as slaves in the United States. The holiday took on added significance this year amid the nationwide protests against systemic racism. Well, today is June 19th, so it's uh, Juneteenth, which is a special holiday in the African-American community. And I just wanted to come out and show my support because I feel like it's really important that we just not just acknowledge American holidays, but our own holidays as well. Uh, yes, I've been celebrating Juneteenth since 2011. My parents made sure to uh, teach me all like the history of our people and not just American history as well, so I'm appreciative of that. 
The Chinese government stressed on Friday that if the U.S. decides to cut off economic ties with China, it will only further harm the American people. Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesman Xiao Li Shan said on Friday that to artificially cut off the global industrial and supply chain and change the laws of economics is unrealistic and unadvisable. He stressed the move would not help the United States to solve its problems. The comments came after President Donald Trump renewed his threats to cut ties a day after U.S. diplomats held high-level talks with Beijing and after his top U.S. trade negotiator said severing trade relations was not a viable option. China hosted a high-level video conference on Belt and Road International Cooperation this Friday. Chinese President Xi Jinping sent a message to the conference, noting that thanks to the active participation and strong support of all parties, the Belt and Road Initiative has evolved into the largest platform for international cooperation. Among the attendees were the WHO Director General, as well as foreign ministers and top-level officials from 25 countries. In his message, President Xi said that China will work with its partners to make the initiative a model of cooperation to face challenges together. He added that the initiative will be a model of health to protect the safety and welfare of the peoples, and an example of recovery on restoring economic and social activity. The Chinese capital, Beijing, reported 25 new confirmed locally transmitted COVID-19 cases on Thursday, with 21 linked to the Xinfadi wholesale market in the southern district of Fengtai, according to local authorities. On Thursday, Beijing detected 25 new confirmed COVID-19 cases with 17 male cases and 8 female cases. Their average age is 45, with the youngest being 25 years old, and the eldest being 69. One of them has Beijing household registration and 24 have household registrations in other provinces. 18 cases occur in Fengtai District, 5 ones in Daxin District, 1 in Qixian District and 1 in Hailian District. In clinical types, 7 are mild cases and 18 are normal cases. Of the total confirmed cases, 21 are related to the Xin Fadi wholesale market. The remaining 4 cases are under epidemiological investigation. South Korean President Moon Jae-in accepted the resignation of Unification Minister Kim Jong-chul on Friday. According to the presidential office, the move came days after Kim said he wanted to resign to take responsibility for increasing tensions between the North and South. Kim quit after the inter-Korean liaison office was destroyed by Fong Yang on Tuesday. The South Korean president appointed Kim as unification minister in April last year as talks between the Trump administration and North Korea began falling apart over stalled nuclear negotiations. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen proposed a virus recovery package for the bloc, totaling 1.85 trillion euros during a video link summit between EU leaders. This is a chance Europe cannot afford to miss. I want a Europe which is better able to weather global storms and provide a safe home for future generations. So I'm looking forward to today's discussion. I'm convinced that for common success, we must stay focused on the big picture. We must all pull together. We cannot afford any delay. New MFF, this is a huge stimulus of 1,850 billion euros. And it does not only help the economies of the countries which were hit hardest by the virus, it also helps the countries whose economies have been hit hard indirectly the United Nations warned on Friday that its humanitarian logistics flights could be largely grounded in July due to a lack of funds, severely compromising global aid operations. Unless a substantial injection of funds is provided by donors by the end of the first week of July, WFP will have no choice but to ground most of its humanitarian air fleet by the end of July. This is a, a response on a scale never seen before. And with the pandemic showing no signs of abating, it is crucial that the response doesn't stop now when it is uh, needed most. The common services budget of 965 million to maintain the air service 
until the end of the year is only 14% funded. Only $178 million has so far been confirmed or advanced the former head of the WHO and former Norwegian Prime Minister, Gro Harlem Brutland, has stated that the US government has caused lasting damage to the UN system and the broader principles of multilateralism since 2017. An especially sad irony that this assault on multilateralism is being led by the country that played the single biggest role in the establishment and maintenance of the multilateral system after 1945. To my deep regret, the current US administration has done lasting damage to the UN system and the broader principles of multilateralism since 2017. President Trump's latest decision <clears throat> to withdraw the US from participation in the World Health Organization is perhaps the most astonishingly and transparently counterproductive of all these moves. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said on Friday that the COVID-19 pandemic has turned the world of work upside down and stressed that things cannot continue as before the crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has turned the world of work upside down. Every worker, every business and every corner of the globe has been affected. Hundreds of millions of jobs have been lost. The world of work cannot and should not look the same after this crisis. It's time for a coordinated global, regional, and national effort to create decent work for all as the foundation of a green, inclusive, and resilient recovery. For example, a shift of taxation from payroll to carbon could help to go a long way in this direction. With smart and timely action at all levels and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as our guide, we can emerge from this crisis stronger, with better jobs and a brighter, more equal and greener future for all. And we're taking one last very short break now, so stay with us for more. Welcome back to From the South. Palestinians living in the Jordan Valley are afraid of losing their land and being unable to access their crops if Israel continues with its illegal annexation plans. The Jordan River shorelands, which were used for grazing, have been usurped by illegal Israeli settlers. Palestinians in the area are forced to work for the settlers for about $3 an hour. U.S. President Donald Trump proposed the annexation plan as part of his so-called Middle East peace plan. The plan has been widely rejected internationally as it undermines Palestine's right to self-determination. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that the annexation process is set to begin on July 1st. The African Union has launched a unified trade platform to enable the supply of COVID-19-related critical medical equipment in the continent. The project is called the African Medical Supplies Platform and is a digital portal that will serve to coordinate the complicated access, procurement and distribution of medical supplies needed by each member of the AU. The project seeks to improve access by Af African countries to the health materials needed to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. The new platform had been announced on Wednesday by South African President Cyril Ramaphosa, although the official launch came on Thursday at a press conference led by the South African President and the Commission Chair. I appointed an envoy in addition to the other envoys who are a 75-year-old Congolese refugee and preacher has decided to raise awareness in the Kakuma refugee camp after watching videos on a friend's phone about people dying from COVID-19 in Europe. The Juba Alois attached posters and a loudspeaker to his bicycle to accomplish his mission. He broadcasts as he cycles, also making stops to further educate others in the camp. The camp is home to almost 200,000 people and the Juba believes that spreading accurate information to as many people as possible is an extremely important task. There are two groups of refugees, refugees who are informed and refugees who are not. There are no people coming together to pray and I love to preach and sing in the church. 
I will create awareness every day so that people stay safe from coronavirus. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, artists are decorating the walls of the capital, Kinshasa, to raise awareness about the COVID-19 pandemic. Director of the Academy of Fine Arts, Henry Kalama, said that the aim of this campaign is to fight misinformation, to show that the disease is real and that everyone must unite to fight the pandemic. The statuettes, they are protective in themselves, and therefore the most important thing for me was to pass on this message of protection. And I think the statue was the right way to get that message across, because it's protective in itself. Prime Minister of Lebanon Hassan Diab assured that national interests will be prioritized in the face of the latest U.S. sanctions against neighboring Syria. The Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act punishes any person or state with links to Syria. According to the Lebanese Prime Minister, the interests of his country will not be subject to the U.S. law. The app referred to warnings from former Prime Minister Saeed Hariri about the consequences of not complying with this extraterritorial U.S. legislation. German NGO Sea Watch says it has picked up over 210 migrants off Libya's coast this week. The NGO has performed three rescues over the last 48 hours and is demanding a port of safety to immediately disembark those rescued. In a first operation on Wednesday morning, almost 100 migrants were rescued around 29 nautical miles off the coast of Libya. Some were given immediate medical attention, among them women and children, as well as several who were injured. Sea Watch noted in a statement that the injuries included chemical burns from the fuel salt water mixture in the dinghy they were travelling aboard. The organisation added that Libyan Coast Guards would have returned the migrants to Libya if they had not brought them to safety first. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telly Sir English, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.